Okay, so in chapter four, we're going to be moving on to measurement within social work research. Uh, this is a topic that I'm particularly interested in. I've always kind of been a little bit more focused on how we can come up with accurate, reliable, valid measurements within the field of social science. And I think that the chapter does a great job of giving an overview of the importance of measurement in social welfare research um, and also how to make sure that we're using the best possible measurements out there that are both um, accurate and consistent in their use. So again, as opposed to the natural sciences, social sciences are a little bit unique in that um, a lot of the concepts that we're measuring are um, a little bit more abstract than something within the natural sciences, which might be like distance, speed, temperature. Um, in social science, we do with a lot of concepts and concepts are basically mental images that summarize um, similar observations, concepts, or ideas. So as opposed to an operational definition, a conceptualization is more of working out what a term really means um, in research. So within the realm of mental health, if you're looking for like a conceptual definition, potentially of, let's say, an anxiety disorder, um, we kind of know what the concept of anxiety is, but if we're to really conceptualize anxiety disorder, we could go to the DSM and um, kind of look up what actually uh, anxiety disorder really is. And so once we come up with a conceptual definition, then we can move into an operational definition, which is really defining exactly what we're trying to measure in quantifiable terms. So operationalization is the process of understanding what is measured, how the indicators are measured, the rules used to assign a value to what is observed and to interpret the value. That's kind of a mouthful. But it's essentially a statement of how we are intending to quantify this concept. So for instance, if we're going to use the same example of an anxiety disorder, we could look up what the conceptual definition of anxiety is based on the DSM, but an operationalized definition might be number of times somebody feels anxious per 24 hour period or rating of a anxiety intensity on a scale of one through five. This is putting quantifiable terms to our con conceptual definition so that we can accurately measure it. And within both research and practice, there's scales that can be used to measure these operationally defined problems, um, which could be like a composite score, um, which can be a sum or average of responses. So if we're going to use the anxiety example again, we could talk about like the Beck Anxiety Index, which is a, a scale to measure anxiety. So it measures symptoms of anxiety. And if you have something that's a standardized measure or a standardized scale, you can create a more in deep, in depth measure of the construct um, than with a single component question. So an example might be looking at all the different components of anxiety and what it might look for somebody like nervousness, jitteriness, uh, racing heart, sleep deprivation, uh, versus a feeling of just kind of feeling a little bit uneasy. Uh, a scale helps us to look at the whole problem more in depth. But just some cautions here, um, when you're using scales and something that I've seen in practice um, is that each question doesn't measure the same concept and oftentimes you get a sum score. Um, so there might be a cutoff. So like if somebody scores above 10 on a certain scale, that might be like a, a good screening that they are having symptoms of anxiety. But if you were to think about it, maybe somebody just has one symptom that's really, really severe. Um, so because they have one severe symptom, and they mark all the other symptoms false or zero, it still might be indicative of an anxiety disorder or like a problem with anxiety, which that might be more problematic within clinical practice as opposed to research. Also be aware that some questions and responses may cluster together within subsets. So sometimes makers of scales will do this on purpose because they want to get at different components of a, a certain type of social construct. So if you were to think of a scale of quality of life, um, there might be certain components of those items that kind of correlate strongly together. So if we're looking at quality of life, there might be several questions that are related to quality of relationships. Um, so you might see that those kind of clustering together and there might be multiple questions getting at the same essential construct or, or subset. Also worth noting that some questions are weighted unevenly in a scale. And this is more of an issue with like larger scale type question or larger questionnaires that have a lot of different items on them. So sometimes if you're taking like a full assessment, like a full mental health assessment, some items on scales might be weighted a little bit more heavily than others. Just things to be aware of. 
Um, certain scales have negatively I worded items. Um, there's, a, there's a few different cautions and most of the time if you're looking at a published scale, you can find more information about this within the, the, the directions or the author's comments about the, the measurement properties of the, of the scale. So with the Likert scale, something that you're probably familiar with, um, oftentimes you see these in the form of on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pain? You know, rating the intensity of your workout or your level of um, satisfaction with a certain program that you've partaken in. Likert scales often used to measure um, the degree to which a respondent holds a particular value or feeling, maybe how strongly you feel about a certain social topic, um, and the scores are often summed or averaged. So lots of times you might see a scale that's got like several different Likert items, and those can be scaled to give you a composite score. So with the semantic differential scale, concept of interest is described by a number of opposite pairs of words. So this one isn't as common, or I don't typically see it in research used as much, um, but you might see an example of how likely would you be to recommend a fellow classmate to take this course. One being very unlikely and five being extremely likely. That way then you could kind of rate where you would rate your level of recommendation of the course uh, to your classmate. So the words are on the opposite end of the spectrum and you would just kind of put your response somewhere in the middle. So Gutman skills capture different levels of concept uh, where the different levels may be different in strengths of an attitude, uh, different intensity of services, or difficulty in answering the question. So an example might be like in the Beck depression scale, you would see something like, I occasionally feel sad or blue. I often feel sad or blue. I feel sad or blue most of the time. I always feel sad and I can't stand it. So if you endorse the most severe, I always feel blue and I can't stand it, that would essentially imply that you also um, endorse the three milder symptoms. So if we're looking at treatment as a variable, treatments must be explicitly detailed and detailed nominally. Um, so detailed enough that you can actually describe what was the intention of the treatment, what was the focus of the intervention, and how was that measured. So in research, the intervention has to occur as purely as possible and kind of like within, within a pretty structured protocol. The description of the treatment must also provide full synopsis of the actual operationalization of the intervention. So in quantifiable terms, what exactly was done? And the reason that this needs to be done is because if somebody were to replicate the study, you would have to prove that they would have similar enough results, specifically if it's going to be an intervention, because the whole purpose of doing the study is to really show the effectiveness or the efficacy of an intervention. And through operationalization of the intervention, we'll then be able to really better demonstrate the efficacy of our intervention and also increase the likelihood that the person who might be using a similar intervention would also come up with similar results. So when you're gathering data, there's a few different ways to come about with data. Um, there's direct measures, which is a measure of a client on a specific outcome, uh, versus inference measures, which can be done via interview, self-administrated score, questionnaires. So a direct measure might be more thought of in like a, where there's a bar where it might be like an intelligence test versus an inference measure might be something more along the lines of somebody's opinion or somebody's thoughts or experiences. In the chapter on ethics, we covered expedited reviews, um, which is often used for previous or da data collected from previously collected sources. So lots of times there's big data, which is kind of like a hot topic in social sciences right now. Um, so if there's previously collected quantitative data, such as large government conducted research, uh, where it might be like tens of thousands of different app or participants who've participated in the study and the data is already collected, you might be able to get your study to go through a little bit faster and a little bit easier. Um, so when you're using these large data sets, you're not the one who's actually collecting the data, but you're using data sets that are already out there and using that to test certain hypotheses or certain relationships amongst variables. One of the terms that's often used for that is like data mining, um, using the data that's out there already to try to look at relationships. So some other forms of data methods is looking at primary documents, maybe such as medical records. Um, again, this might be a little bit more challenging. Um, again, something that you would have to have a lot of informed consent and cleared with the hospital IRB. You can certainly imagine the ethical considerations that go along with this. 
Um, but there are certain situations where if it's done in bulk, where it's not really um, looking at individual treatment records, but rather like treatment records as a whole, lots of times hospitals will want to look at that to see um, like as a program evaluation, like how we're really doing and if we're really meeting our aims and objectives here. Unobtrusive measures are, are often taken from social media um, or traces from past behavior. I think it's interesting that it's called unobtrusive measures because it feels pretty intrusive to me. Uh, but certainly, as you can see, there's a lot of people are really interested in our social media behavior and a lot of people are really interested in collecting that data. So that's going to be a bigger thing that we'll probably see a lot more in our lifetime now that that data is out there already, which gives us a lot of information about people's social behaviors. And you might guess that triangulation is pretty commonly used within social sciences. For things that are difficult to measure, it's a good idea to have more than one way to measure them. Um, certainly you can think of an example of where you might want inter rater reliability or potentially two raters of the same behavior or multiple ways of measuring a certain type of behavior. So if you can think of the likelihood of a student succeeding, lots of times the university might want to look at their past grades and also their test score. So that's two ways of looking at the likelihood that the student's going to be successful. And then through triangulation and potentially even looking at references, we can make a reasonable estimate of what a student's likelihood of succeeding is going to be. So something that's unique to social sciences, or I feel like it's probably used more than some of the other sciences, is qualitative data. Um, which is more of an inductive approach, approach than a deductive approach. And really what that means is that we're collecting data in a less quantifiable way, although you can certainly quantify qualitative data such as interviews and behavioral observations. But the general purpose of qualitative data is more to get like a richer, deeper understanding of a person's lived experience, or sometimes it's just subjective observations of an individual acting in their natural environment. And you can collect this data and review it in order to help to craft a theory together about why a certain phenomenon might be existing or a certain behavior or social phenomena might may be occurring. And we'll have a whole chapter devoted to qualitative data re later in the semester. But what's important now is just that you understand the difference between quantitative, which is more of like a numbers based approach to measurement versus qualitative, which is a little bit more focused on an inductive approach, which is a little bit more focused on like an intimate understanding of a social phenomenon or concept. Okay, so something that people struggle with a lot is the different levels of measurement. And I'm going to go through each of the different levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So nominal is a qualitative way of measuring information, which is a little bit more focused on classification or categorization. There's no mathematical interpretation and the categories must be mutually exhaustive. So examples might be like eye color, hair color, dog, cat, um, something that's mutually exclusive and more along the lines of categorical versus ordinal data, which is more quantitative in nature, which is where somebody lands in the order of things. So first, second, third place, each measurement is assigned a specific order in its magnitude. So greater and less than statements can be made. Um, you can imagine a scale, something like strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. So these are like an order of intensity of a response. So interval measure, you can think of something that might be more likely to see in natural science as well. Um, so it's distance between measurements. So you could think of um, something like the change of temperature from 30 to 40 degrees versus 70 to 80 degrees. The intervals that we have here help us to be consistent with our measurements. But there's really not like an absolute zero here. So um, 80 degrees isn't twice as much as 40 degrees. And gaps between numbers on the scale are meaningful because the gaps between the numbers should be consistent across the scale. And intervals kind of help us to get a feel for that. Um, what a distance between two scores might be um, wherever it lays on the continuum. So racial level of measurement actually does have a zero. So you could think of height, per instance. There is a possibility of something being zero inches um, and something being five feet or six feet. Um, there is an absolute zero here. You could think about your grade, too. Um, there could be an absolute zero for something. There could be a 100 for something. And data collected can be... Um, compared and manipulated arithmetically. So you could think about your GPA, which is a combination of a, a variety of ratio scales. And that helps to give us a standard to which we can kind of compare somebody's performance across time or across different coursework.
So a couple of unique cases here are dichotomy, which is like just a yes or no. Uh, there's only really two possible values. And ultimately, when you're deciding which level of measurement to use, um, it's best to try to measure variables at the highest level possible. Um, so if you can get away with it, the, if there's something that's only possible to measure with a yes, no, dichotomous, maybe living or not living, and there's no real in between, um, then you could probably use dichotomous. But for most things within social science, you would want to use the highest level of measurement possible to try to as best as you can kind of capture the range and intensity or frequency or duration or whatever it may be. And the more range you have, the more the larger the number of statistical and analytical options that you really have to interpret that data. All right, so for the next section is a really condensed version of measurement error. Um, there's a few different types of measurement error. Um, you can imagine within social sciences, there's so many room for errors and miscalculating and misinterpreting data. Um, and we try to be aware of that and try to minimize it as much as we really can. So a systematic error is consistent bias that can be accounted for something that we can really change to um, within our control. Within all research, you should have some level of control over your variables in your study. And through systematic error is probably something that we can really do something about or something that we can address versus random error is more unpredictable in terms, it can be the, the weather, it could be somebody getting into a car accident before they get to your office. It can be all kinds of stuff that you really can't control, but still gonna cause some type of measurement error at the end of your study. Okay, so some of the systematic errors that we can really address, although there's the random errors that we really don't have too much control over, there are some systematic errors such as social desirability, uh, which is really just the desire to be perceived positively within a situation. So you can think about somebody who might not wanna talk about their substance use history or their trauma history or things that they're not so excited about talking about, or maybe they just wanna be perceived in an accurate light. And you can imagine the world of social work, there's probably a lot of people who are really uncomfortable talking about some of their personal histories. So um, this can lead to systematic errors. Ways to address that might be by training the person who's collecting the data to be a little bit more sensitive about the way that they're asking questions or maybe rewording questions so that they're a little bit less intimidating. Acquiescence bias is the bias to endorse yes on all items. So you can imagine something like a review of a presentation that you've gone to and they ask for feedback. Um, you might just say yes for every single item on there just because it's easier than really thinking hard about the items that are involved. So some people do that just because they don't have time to really think through all the different items. Uh, there's, a, there's a few different reasons why people might have the acquiescence bias. So a leading question is kind of self-explanatory where it leads a participant to answer something in a um, maybe even like an unfavorable or a favorable way. Maybe asking somebody, do you support our freedoms to carry guns? By the way that that's asked, it's implying that there is a freedom there. And if you don't support the freedom, then maybe you need to rethink your values or something like that. Just the first topic that came off the top of my head. And other examples might be, do you see any problems with your boss or any problems with your coworkers? It might be leading them to answer negatively, kind of like based on the tone of the question. And other types of systematic errors are just when you think about a questionnaire that may or may not be like specifically tuned to a certain type of subgroup. So certain types of questions may not fully consider cultural considerations, might not consider certain demographic information such as gender, age, race. Certainly we want to kind of consider who are asking the questions to and kind of modify the questions if we can to be appropriate to that population. So when we're really assessing whether our measures are accurately measuring what we want them to. A big concept here, like one of the big takeaways for this section is reliability. And that's whether a measurement consistently yields equivalent scores of a phenomena. So is it gonna consistently measure the concept in the same way every time that you use it? And I'll break it down into test-retest reliability. Uh, that could be an example of like giving an intelligence test now and giving one five years down the road. Somebody's intelligence more or less static, like you wouldn't expect too much change in it. Internal consistency, that being like if you were to measure in a, an intelligence test, all the items should be related to intelligence across the whole test. Alternate forms, if you're going to have two different forms of an intelligence test, they both should kind of wield similar responses. And iterator reliability, meaning that if more than one person gave an intelligence test, the subject's IQ should be about the same at the end of it. So again, test-retest reliability is looking at how closely the measurement of a fixed phenomena 
at two points is in time. If we were to think about one, like one being a perfect test retest score, um, if somebody's got an IQ score of 100 now and they got an IQ score of 100 five years from now, that would be perfect one correlation. But most of the time that doesn't happen. And we're looking for something that's like a 0.7 or like 70% correlation or anything 0.8 or above is really, really strong or very strong score on test retest reliability. So some assumptions that may or may not hold with test retest reliability is that nothing's affecting the, the phenomena of interest in the time period. So you could think about, I keep using IQ here, but um, you would assume that somebody didn't have a stroke or a concussion or a traumatic brain injury between testing. Um, also that the subject isn't a test affected by testing conditions. So if the first time they take it in a, like a Pearson testing center and the second time they take it in a crowded subway or something like that, there, there's an assumption that the person is being tested in similar situations, um, maybe similar time of the day, similar environment, etc. Regarding internal consistency is how closely associated um, a single concept is measured on the scale. So there's a few different ways of measuring internal consistency. One of them is split half reliability. So does the first half of the test perfectly uh, or very strongly consistent with the second half, if assuming that all the items are measuring the same thing. And there are also more sophisticated statistical ways of measuring this, such as the Cronbox Alpha, which is a, a statistical measure of the correlation between items on a test and how closely they relate to one, one another. Yet another form of reliability is alternate form reliability. And again, how closely do the responses to similar questions correspond to each other or relate to each other? So the higher the level of correspondence, the higher level of reliability. You can think about an example of um, an intelligence test. So you could think of like a Wechsler intelligence test versus like a Stanford Binet. Both of those forms of intelligence measures should give you pretty similar results at the end of the day or at the end of the assessment. So into rater reliability, you could think about like the Olympic. There's multiple raters of the same performance and those should be pretty closely related to each other. So if somebody gives a performance a nine or a 10, you wouldn't expect that one of the other judges would give it a one or a two. So similarly, keeping with the intelligence score here, if we had two different psychologists administering an test of intelligence for the same person, they should come up with a pretty similar score. And the, high, the more similar they are, the more confident we are that there is the trait of inner rate of reliability here. Okay, so regarding measurement validity, which is the extent to which the measure actually measures what they're supposed to measure, uh, there's face validity, content validity, criterion validity, and construct validity that we're going to be covering. So face validity is basically what it sounds like. Are we confident the measure appears valid? So on its face, is it really measuring what we think it's going to be measuring? So if we're measuring personality, let's say it's like a MMPI scale of somebody's personality. By looking at the items, they should kind of indicate items that would be related to somebody's personal characteristics. But if we we're measuring something so complicated as personality, we would want to look at content validity and does the measure really cover the full range of a concept's meaning? So something more complicated like personality type or you'd probably need more than a couple of questions. So like an MMPI has 420 questions, uh, which is pretty time intensive, right? So people have toiled over content validity of the MMPI for years to really ensure that it's capturing the full range of the concept that we're trying to measure. So criterion validity is looking at a certain criteria, obviously. So are the measures scores similar enough to an already val validated measure of the same construct? So if we're looking at a new measure that we're going to develop to look at somebody's rating with life satisfaction, we might want to take our new measure and compare it to another already standardized quality of life measurement. So um, concurrent criterion validity, we would look at the degree to which the two responses merge together, to which both measures kind of agree with one another. Otherwise, there's also predictive validity. So the ability to measure today and accurately predict in the future. So um, you could, again, think about like, like the ACT or the SAT, when we're really trying to predict what the likelihood that a student's going to succeed moving forward. So does the SAT or the ACT really have the kind of predictive qualities that we would hope that it would? So when we're looking at construct validity, we're looking at whether a measure really relates to other measures as specified by theory. So there's discriminant validity, convergent validity, known groups validity, and factorial validity. 
And I promise we're going to get through all of these and you'll survive this section on measurement. So construct validity um, regarding discriminant validity, scores on one measure are compared to scores on another related but different concept. So if we're looking at a scale of um, a scale of somebody's depression, our, our new scale to measure depression should relate closely to other field scores of depression. So our new scale should probably closely relate to the back depression inventory, but it shouldn't relate so close to the back anxiety index because these are separate concepts, so they should be able to discriminate one from the other. Um, so for measuring depressive symptoms, we should really be sure that um, we're measuring depressive symptoms and not some, some other type of symptom. So convergent and known groups. Convergent uh, measures should close, that closely associate between two measures of the same construct are assessed using different measures. So again, using the example of a depression scale, whatever a new scale should relate to the Beck depression scale or another scale that's widely used, dairy reactor to depression scale that's standardized. So the two of them should converge pretty well. Another way of looking at this validity is through known groups validity, which is ultimately if our measure correctly assesses score differences between groups um, constructed for a different phenomena being measured. So if we were to look at a score and we, or a measure and see can it really discriminate between a group who has a diagnosis and a group who doesn't have a diagnosis. So for instance, at the VA, I often use the CAPS-5, which is a measure of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so if we had a group of people who had post-traumatic stress and a group who didn't have post-traumatic stress, and we knew that ahead of time, our, and we kind of mixed them together of who had it and who didn't, and our measure assessed all these people, it should be able to tease those groups back, back apart if we kind of already knew their baseline. And factorial, um, again, it's more like a statistical component of validity, which is probably beyond the course, but still important to know, is how are the items in the measure related to each other and the overall score, which kind of relates to like clustering of items that are on a bigger scale. Um, so if there's a larger scale of personality, scores that might be indicative of antisocial personality traits should cluster closely together. And through factorial analysis, we can kind of figure out which factors are clustering together on that measure through different factor loadings and statistical analyses. So now that you know about these properties, there are certain ways that we can improve reliability and validity of our measures. Sometimes there's focus groups where people get together and discuss which items should be included and which ones shouldn't. There's also different cognitive interviews that can be done, audio tape test reviews of pretest phase of a survey. The textbook talks about these in a few different ways, but when you're when somebody's developing a skill like this the standardization process there's a lot of work that goes into it and discussion and um, debates about which items should be included and which ones shouldn't and why all these things fit together or why they don't fit because we want to make sure that if we're going to be developing a new measure that it's standardized and that it's valid and accurate and we're really getting at what we're hoping to get at. So I know that a lot of people in this course really want to go into clinical work. So I think it's good that we spend a good amount of time talking about clinical status or how these measures can be used to identify a certain clinical status. So one way is the cut scores, which defines the presence or absence of a particular condition. So we might just say using a PHQ-9 or something like that, there's a certain cut score, which above a certain score might be indicative of psychological distress or depressed mood. By that cut score, then we might be able to do more clinical assessment. Um, and if somebody's below the cut score, maybe we can just kind of leave it be because they seem to be doing fine. So again, the validity here is established by comparing the skills classification with a well-known or already existing, already used kind of measurement. So another thing that's important to realize is that we use these scales to look for or we really evaluate for true negatives and true positives. So a true negative, a scale, like if somebody didn't have a mental health disorder, our scale should accurately screen them out. And if they do, um, a true positive, that, that's what we're looking for. What we're trying to do is to eliminate false negatives and false positives. So we're trying to prevent people who uh, didn't score above the cutoff but do have a mental health disorder from being kind of like brushed under the rug or, or missed. Um, and we also want to prevent people who maybe don't have a mental health disorder and are doing fine from being screen positive for having something. So other important concepts are specificity and sensitivity. This is closely related to false negatives and false positives. So um, we want our measure to be sensitive enough that it picks up everybody who might be a true positive. Uh, but not sensitive enough that we're getting false positives. 
Similarly, specificity, we want to make sure that we're specific enough um, that we're not getting any false positives. And there's, there's kind of a balance that um, developers come up with. And we could talk about ethics here too. So you could think of a, maybe an example that's come up in the past is like HIV testing. There's always going to be a certain number of false positives and a, a number of false negatives for HIV tests, which you could think of. It's very, really, really small number. Um, but we also, I mean, we have to think of, is it more important that people who don't have HIV get their, get their negative or that people who do have HIV get their positive results if they really do? So you could think of the dangers of somebody who had a false negative, somebody who really does have HIV, but was told that they don't, the risk there might be that they could possibly infect others or that um, they could potentially not get the treatment that they needed to prevent the progression of the disease. On the other side, we could think about like a false positive and what would happen if our test wasn't, didn't have the specificity that it really needed. Maybe somebody would be told that they had HIV and they didn't and became extremely emotionally distressed about it. Test developers have to come up with a good balance between the two of these different constructs when they're coming up with their new measures. So diversity considerations, I would say like with a, with a lot of measures within social sciences, we have to consider somebody's culture. Do the conceptual definitions mean the same across cultures? Um, a lot of times they don't. So if you're thinking about like a, a personality test, it's, it's you can't just strictly change it from English to Spanish and expect that everything's going to be accurate and valid afterwards because um, there's certain things that might not be culturally appropriate or maybe things that don't translate so well across language. You could think of maybe certain things that you've read from Google Translate that have translated from a different language into English and kind of lost its meaning. And especially for measuring something as complicated as mental health issues, uh, maybe items aren't equivalent across diverse groups. All right, so some other considerations here, implications for evidence-based practice. For those of you who are doing clinical practice, administration of the skill does take some time. But now that you kind of know the more about the basics of measurement, I, I would hope that you would incorporate more uh, practice evaluation into your clinical work. Certainly some skills cost more than others. There are certain skills that you have to pay for administration versus those that are public domain that are freely available to anybody. Um, some other considerations here are reactivity. Um, certain people may respond differently just because they want to be perceived in a certain way, which can lead to measurement error. Systematic measurement error is something that we can address and something that I'm hoping that you would think about moving forward. But if you incorporate this more into your practice, the more it's going to be accepted and more people are going to be comfortable with um, responding to the types of measurements and questions that you're asking.